Hello, this is a video about the web interface or probably the initial setup and then a web in the rest of the web interface of these uh, Pharos CPE, where is it, 710s and it's probably also similar for the other uh, Pharos devices as well. Firstly, we need to set a static IP address so that these, both of these are in factory default mode. There's no pre-configuration, they haven't been uh, set up as a pair or anything like that um, by the supplier. So we need to set an IP address on the laptop of 192.168.0. We can do anything within that range, but let's do dot .55, why not? And we don't need to set anything else. Now. Let me get this into a smaller window. We now go to 192.168.0.254. We should see uh, the Pharos configuration interface. And we do. Select a region. And uh, this is where it sets your power level limits and which channels you have access to. Yep, should ask you to set a new username and a new password. We probably actually want to do quick setup because it will talk you through everything that you need to set. So this is the one I'm setting up now is going to be the access point. So I want that to be the access point. Ask me to set an IP address. I'm going to leave that on uh, the default for the moment. Ask me to set the name. So I'm going to call this ISPP2P. And whether we want to set security. You want to set security unless you're running a public uh, Wi Fi point. If you don't set security, hmm, you're probably asking for trouble especially if you're going to be using it for your internal LAN between two buildings. Um, definitely set a password in that instance. Um, and that might be as simple as pressing finish on that. So that's number one is now configured. We've got an extra light has come on on that one. I'm now going to move the cable to number two. So the middle light's gone out because I've unplugged the uh, network cable that plugged into it. But so number two, the, the network light will come on. And on this one, I will plug it into my main LAN. Here is a cable that's going to be plugged into my main LAN now, so the LAN light will come back on over on uh, number one, or the, the transmitting device. I now need to configure the client device. Let's just refresh the page, and we're going to go through the same kind of setup. So admin and admin is the default login, and uh, then you need to set your country. It'll ask you to change the password again. Go through the quick setup. This time it is a client. Give it a different IP address, otherwise you will collide with the IP address of the other device. Give it the same name. Give it the same password. And we should be done. If I bring up a command prompt to ping, 
the main point, and that should start responding to pings, hopefully, in not too long. There we go. Right hand side is uh, access point number one, or the uh, the access point, and then the left side is the um, the client device. So what's going on here is the the signals bouncing off the table, or just they're so close to each other that they can pick each other's uh, signal up. What I can do now is change my network back to obtain automatically and I should get an IP address from my main LAN. Those will uh, stop pinging because I'm now on my main LAN. So I'll ping the internet. There we go, I have access to the internet. And if I do a speed test, let's see what speed we get across these. The theoretical maximum speed on the box is 867 megabits per second, but as with most Wi-Fi stuff, you will not achieve that speed um, in real-world use. So that's how you use the quick setup to do a point-to-point -point link with these Varos access point and client uh, devices. There's a lot of other options as well, like the, uh, I don't know if you saw it in the quick setup, um, AP router and AP client to do with which side has management capabilities um, and uh, doing NAT and other things. But I will leave you to figure out those yourself. If what you've seen so far is all you needed to do and you've worked out how you can do your point to point link, uh, I will quickly just say in the access point you might want to go down and turn off the enable SSID broadcast which means if somebody looks at a list of wireless networks they won't see your network uh, as one that they can attempt to connect to. Um, so it just makes it less obvious that there's a point-to-point -point wireless link um, set up and in use. If this video has been helpful to you at this stage it would be really helpful to me if you wouldn't mind subscribing to my YouTube channel. You don't need to have the video notifications switched on but the subscriber numbers really do help. Um, but what I will do now is move on to just going through the rest of the um, web admin pages of this router uh, and access point client. So at the moment there's probably not going to be much difference between them, but at the moment I'm on the one which is in client mode, uh, which is the one that's closest in network terms to uh, the laptop that I'm recording this video on. If you've used any of the Unify nano stations or Pico stations, this web interface is almost exactly the same. Um, and it's the same with the um, TP-Link Omada stuff. The controller is almost exactly the same as the Ubiquiti stuff. So uh, they're basically playing off on the um, if people have used Unify or Ubiquiti stuff they will then know how to use the TP-Link equivalent product. So this is the status page here uh, of the client and it gives you details like the signal strength, um, signal to noise ratio, what channel it's using and, um, and other details like the MAC address of the device. Further down at the bottom you've also got uh, data throughput and items that are connected but uh, because we're in client mode it's slightly different in the network tab you can set its IP address and whether it has access to the internet using a default gateway uh, it can also do uh, be a DHCP server and do IPv6 I do IPv6, let's see what options we get. Uh, it can get an IP via DHCP v6, uh, Slack, uh, which is auto configuration, or static configuration. It can do VLANs. For the management side, and IP and MAC binding might be for its DHCP server, possibly, or maybe for um, routing on interfaces, maybe. I don't know about that, I'm afraid. Under the wireless tab, so uh, bearing in mind this is for the client side, 
uh, not the access point side at the moment. We can select uh, what technology it's using, what channel width, essentially bandwidth and speed uh, it's using, and then what uh, rates it's using over that channel width. It's antenna, which I'm not sure you can actually change, so I don't know why it uh, gives you an option on that. And transmit power. So if uh, you've got two devices very close to each other, you might want to uh, change the transmit power to be much lower than it, it is by default. Got the SSID that it joins, password, and uh, the type of encryption. In fact, it may be worth as well getting rid of WPA original, so making sure that all of your stuff is set to WPA2. Uh, in fact, I might do that now just with my demonstration link. So I need to do encryption, oh no, sorry, version to be WPA2 because it's much more secure. And there's only going to be one encryption type, so I'll leave that on auto. When I click on apply, what I would expect to see here is I lose access to this side of the link because that is the access point. And suddenly my client is uh, is misconfigured. So I need to match the configuration. So WPA2, scroll down, and I'm going to click on apply. And I'd expect soon after to regain access to, um, to the access point side as well, basically the, the far end. Although uh, it has not yet reconnected. And I noticed this earlier when I rebooted the access point that the client seems to take quite some time to um, reconnect to the access point. So I go to status, I'm going to assume, yeah, at the moment it thinks it can't see uh, the, the access point or the far end. So we need to wait for that to decide uh, or pick up on that signal. There we go. And immediately as it showed it on the screen, it's uh, started responding to the pings as well. I now go to the access point. I think it'll tell me I've got an unsaved change that I need to save. So I need to do that. That might be a bit like the Ubiquiti or Unify uh, nano stations where if you make a change, uh, it will not save that change and it will revert the change after a few minutes if you don't go back in uh, to confirm the change. The advantage there is you can make a change to the remote radio and then if you screw up that change and you need to go uh, back to the original configuration you don't have to drive over to that far end point you just wait and then a few minutes later it goes back to the original uh, configuration. So back to the client device and we'll continue down the uh, wireless thing. So I'd been and changed the um, security type to WPA2 only. Then you've got some advanced wireless settings which unless you know what you're doing basically leave those alone. Under the management tab we can open the log, download the logs, uh, set it automatically email the logs. Um, we've got discovery which will allow I think the TP-Link application uh, to discover the device without you having to fill in the IP address. And CDP, I'm afraid I do not know what that is. That'd be something discovery protocol is what I'm going to guess for that. Ping watchdog, which means you can get it to ping an IP address. So uh, the far end radio, for example, um, to the other, the other end of the TP-Link, Pharos link, or the default gateway on the, the far end of the network. If it doesn't receive um, pings from that IP address, the access point, or the, in this case the client, uh, will reboot itself and then um, try to reconnect. So that might be good if you have for some reason an unstable link that will only come up sometimes after you reboot the, the device. You can set it to do that ping. If the link goes down, um, then it will reboot the device and hopefully the link will come back up. Dynamic DNS, but uh, because we're not in client mode or, uh, sorry, um, WISP client mode or um, WISP routing mode, I don't think we have that option enabled at the moment. Options for the web admin server, 
options for SNMP logging and SSH access into the router as well. Under the system tab, we can set the name, which will probably appear on SNMP and any network scanning device uh, software you have. You can set its location, which again, possibly will probably come up on SNMP. You can set the time zone and the time server to synchronize to. Firmware upgrade. At the time of recording this video, there's just one firmware update uh, with not very exciting um, improvements and there's a security change and something else uh, in it. And you can back up and restore your configuration. In the top right, we have the option to change what mode the device is in. And under tools, we can do ping and trace route, which will be fairly self-explanatory. Let's just do ping to the other side of the link. Yep, and that's basically what I'd expect it to do. Just send some pings. Trace route will be very similar. Let's do speed test. Uh, but it, yes, we do need the other side of the link to also be running the speed test. So let's do that. We want to be the server. And I'm guessing we press start. Over here, we are the client. We want to do 192.168.0.254, which is the, um, the, the other end of my radio link. Let's do receive first. What I'm going to assume this does is runs a, a copy of iperf in the background and then does a test and then we'll report the results. So it'll be interesting to see whether this gets any different to my uh, speed tests that I did on the laptop. So the speed test I did on the laptop got 675 megabits per second. I've also seen one as high as 685 megabit. Um, so yeah, we'll see what this one comes up with. Ooh, incredibly low. 394 megabits per second. This makes me want to check that the link still is performing properly uh, as a normal speed, as if I'm a normal client. And whether that speed issue is down to the CPU within the Pharos devices, which does look like it is. So we're, we're at 675, 680. Uh, using a Windows computer to a different, like, like using a proper computer going to a proper speed test server on my LAN. Um, whereas it looks like using the built in speed test does uh, have its, uh, its limitations. Let's do the, the transmit one and see whether that's any different. But I'm going to probably suggest here that this speed test for testing any radio link that's above probably 300 megabits per second might not give you a reliable result. We did get better on the uh, transmit of 533. Let's do the, uh, the receive again, but it's certainly not as quick as what the computer that's plugged into the device can achieve. So uh, yeah, the the radio or the little Pharos device itself cannot cope as um, higher speed on a speed test as a proper computer with a proper CPU um, in it. Yeah, still back down to three hundred and seventy. So that's um, yeah, not worth relying upon other than if you wanted to make sure you're still getting several hundred megabits per second. Right, we've got survey, which will give you a list of the wireless networks available um, in the area. But there's two reasons I'm not going to run this. The first reason is, the first time I did this, the access point, not the access point, the client device crashed and I had to reboot it. Um, so I obviously I don't really want to run that again. Secondly, it will give me a it'll give you a list of all the wireless networks in the area. Um, which will give away uh, more about my setup than I want to uh, give away on YouTube, I'm afraid. Spectrum analysis should be very interesting though. It's impossible to do a spectrum analysis without disconnecting uh, the link between the two Pharos devices or the multiple Pharos devices because to do the spectrum analysis it needs to use the radio which it's using for the link itself. So uh, be aware that when you run this it will disconnect anything that's on that device uh, over the radio side of it. 
that's unavoidable um, and understandable. You can get high-end access point devices, for example, the um, Meraki, Meraki? Cisco Meraki devices have a dedicated radio for uh, spectrum analysis, so it doesn't disconnect when you're doing a, uh, a band scan, basically. So we can see here uh, on the left side, um, it's still pinging the uh, client device, but the access point device at the far end is not responding. That's because that the client device radio is now being used for um, monitoring the radio space, the band scan. And yeah, it gives a just a graph of usage of all the five gigahertz channels, which is pretty and probably quite useful um, if these devices were not just sitting on a desk in my office. And it'd be interesting to see how long until the link to the far end comes back. At the moment, it, oh, now now it's back. So okay, it doesn't it recovers fairly quickly after you do that. Antenna alignment, and it just gives a convenient way of seeing the signal strength, uh, and might even be able to make a beep. Let's see. Yep. The trouble is I'm so close to the other uh, access point that I'm not going to be able to get that down to any kind of signal level that might give um, a different kind of noise. But you can see as I move it around, the signal strength is changing. The point at the back of the other one, yeah, it gets uh, stronger again. And I put it back down on the desk. We're back down to basically, <laughs> well, what was that? <laughs> We've gone, we've gone from a minus number somehow into a plus number uh, of one dBm instead of minus. So that's what the alignment screen does. So that is the settings that you get on the client device. Now I'm going to go over to the access point device. This is what the status page looks like on the access point which will be very similar to the client device, except it won't have signal strength quality because um, it potentially can have multiple clients connected to it. So it can't give you just a, an overall signal strength quality. It can show you per station what the uh, quality is and details about the link rate. And interestingly, it says up here, max TX rate 866 megabits per second, but down here, vaguely relating maybe to the 670 megabits, 75 megabits I can get on a speed test. Let's, let's run this and see. So I'm getting, oh yeah, much lower now, 400, because for some reason it's negotiated a much lower speed, um, possibly because the signal strength is too good. Let me, uh, Yes, <laughs> the signal strength must have been uh, too good for that. Because they were immediately next to each other. So if I can now rerun that speed test. That's more like it. That's the 685 megabit that I've seen. And over here it says um, it's negotiated rate, which will be the physical uh, radio rate of 866 megabits per second, which you will never achieve um, in, a, in a speed test across that link anyway. Interfaces, ARP table, routes, of which there are none, and DHCP clients, because it's not a DHCP server, there are none. Under the network, this is going to be pretty much the same as a client. So if you want to see that, uh, skip back in the video to that section. Wireless, we should see slightly different settings because we're in the access point, not the client mode. So we can have multi SSIDs if we wanted to. So you can add an SSID 
and then change the security setting for that SSID. With different VLANs as well, which is good. And different security configurations per SSID as well. MAC address filtering, terrible idea. It's trivial to uh, spoof a MAC address on a network or on a Wi-Fi network. So do not rely upon MAC address filtering for security on your network. You can have it as an extra layer if you want, but um, assuming that nobody's going to be able to um, view and then spoof a MAC address uh, is a bad idea because that is, is easy to do. And there are tutorials and uh, software out there to do that. Then in the advanced wireless settings, a bit like the other one, we've got uh, settings to do with the distance, um, which probably does stuff to do with radio timing um, and some other stuff, which unless you know what you're doing, don't change. And the management will be exactly the same as the um, client device, so skip back in the video if you want to see that, and the same for the system section as well. And there we go. Hopefully this video has been helpful to you. If it has, it would be really helpful to me if you wouldn't mind subscribing to my YouTube channel. You don't need to have the video notifications switched on, but the subscriber numbers really do help. There might be some other videos as well um, to do with how to factory reset this uh, router and client device stuff. And there may also be a video on uh, how this has performed in one of my setups where it's going to go through some trees, which I'm going to be very interested to see in the summer, and especially in the summer after it's rained and the, the leaves have lots of water on them, uh, how well it performs on that. So uh, have a look in the description for any follow-up videos that I've done uh, about that. So yeah, hopefully this has been helpful to you. Uh, thank you very much for watching.